subcommittee will come to order. Um, Ranking Member Marchant will probably be here uh, soon, but we're going to proceed, and uh, depending on where we are, we may uh, obviously interrupt uh, so that he can give an opening statement should he choose to do so. So let me welcome Mr. Marchant and members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all of those in attendance. Welcome to the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia's subcommittee hearing on telework, breaking new ground. The hearing will examine why telework, which has strong support of Congress and personnel experts as a strategy for addressing emergency preparedness and energy consumption, is not being universally embraced and implemented by federal agencies. Uh, hearing no objection, the chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, I'm going to begin, and then we will follow along as uh, members are present. Ranking Member Marchant, members of the subcommittee, and hearing witnesses, welcome to the subcommittee's hearing on telework. Today's hearing will examine why telework continues to be underutilized by federal agencies and the improvements that are needed to allow more federal employees to participate in telework programs. Telework provides numerous benefits, including increased flexibilities for both employers and employees, continuity of operations during emergency events, and decreased energy use and air pollution. The Office of Personnel Management, OPM, defines telework as work arrangements in which an employee regularly performs officially assigned duties at home or other work sites geographically convenient to the residence of the employee. Many of the current federal programs were developed in response to a provision included in an appropriations bill enacted in October 2000. This law requires each executive branch agency to establish a telework policy under which eligible employees may participate in telecommuting to the maximum extent possible without diminishing employee performance. Under the current legislative framework, the General Services Administration, GSA, and OEM, OPM have leading roles in implementing government-wide telework initiatives. Unfortunately, telework is not being used to the extent it should be. According to OPM's most recent report, only about 119,000 of the approximately 1.8 million Federal employees participated in telework in 2005. That figure represents only 6.6 percent of federal agency employees. Some of the barriers to telework include office coverage, organizational culture, management resistance, and technology security and funding. Today we want to uh, examine ways to address these barriers and encourage teleworking. On May 7, 2007, I, along with my colleague, Ranking Member Kenny Marchant, and the full committee chairman and ranking minority members, Henry Waxman and Tom Davis, sent a letter to 25 federal departments and agencies requesting information on the telework programs of those agencies. The letter was intended to help us better understand how well agency telework programs are working. What we found is that not only is telework inconsistently defined across agencies, many agencies do not effectively measure and track teleworkers. Some agencies do not even know how many of their employees are actually teleworking. In recent years, telework has increasingly been viewed as an important tool for ensuring continuity of essential government services 
in a time of crisis, such as in the event of a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. To help improve the preparedness of the federal government's operation in emergency situations, last session I introduced H.R. 5366, the Continuity of Operations Demonstration Project Act. This legislation provided for a demonstration project under which at least two federal agencies would perform services and operations under a simulated emergency in which federal employees would have to work at locations away from their usual workplace, including home, for at least 10 consecutive days. A number of agencies have taken the initiative to perform demonstration exercises in the last several years, but there are still many agencies that have not done so. I would like to see more agencies test their ability to continue operations in an emergency and incorporate telework into their continuity of operations plan. I'm pleased that Representative John Sarbanes, along with Chairman Henry Waxman and Representative Frank Wolf will join me in introducing the Telework Improvement Act of 2007. This legislation will bring together the efforts of my colleagues and breaks new ground by ensuring that eligible federal employees have the opportunity to telework and that agencies are incorporating telework into their continuity of operations planning. Several other legislative proposals have been introduced, in, been introduced in the House and in the Senate. This issue is receiving some well-deserved attention. The federal government can set the example for teleworking. There are some very successful agency and sub-agency telework programs that can serve as models for the public and private sector. I thank you and look forward to the testimony of today's witnesses. We are fortunate to have a distinguished group of witnesses with us today, and I certainly want to thank you for being here. And now it's my pleasure to yield such time as he might consume to the ranking member, Mr. Marchant, for any opening statement he'd like to make. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congress often focuses <coughs> on where government is failing and how the American taxpayer is not getting what he or she is uh, paying for. Today we will be discussing telework, an issue which demonstrates an opportunity for the federal government to increase productivity while decreasing infrastructure and environmental cost. I look forward to hearing about these opportunities. Mr. Chairman, for the sake of time, I'll leave the rest of my opening statement for the record, and then I would also like to submit for the record an opening statement by Ranking Member Tom Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marchant, and uh, I would also yield time, as he might consume, to Representative Sarbanes, who has indicated and demonstrated a tremendous amount of interest in this area of concern and uh, I rec recognize uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding the hearing. I'm, I'm very excited about the prospects to increase the use of telecommuting and teleworking within the federal government and serve as the kind of model which you alluded to, which the federal government can be, uh, joining actually with others uh, in the private industry, in private industry that have done so much uh, in this area. Um, I had the privilege of being able to offer earlier this year an amendment on to the energy bill that would try to promote this sort of thing. And I want to I thank the chairman for taking the initiative to, to introduce this uh, in a standalone form, as he will be doing, and uh, I'll be joining with him uh, in that. I also want to acknowledge, as he, as he has done, Congressman Wolf's uh, efforts uh, over many years to bring this issue to the forefront. Uh, and we look forward to working with him as well. Um, I represent a district that has a tremendous number of federal employees who commute uh, in and out of the District of Columbia every day and uh, have heard from many of them about the promise of telecommuting and what a difference it can make. Um, my original uh, approach to this issue was with respect to how, you, how the federal government can help reduce its carbon footprint. Um, by promoting tele teleworking, but obviously the benefits go uh, far beyond that. There are many, many dimensions to the issue. Um, in Maryland, we are 
we are about to absorb uh, many new jobs as a result of base realignment and closure uh, commission recommendations. I think that telecommuting can help uh, both in that transition as well as over the long term uh, as the number of jobs uh, increases and, and frankly as the degree of congestion in many parts of my district uh, also increases. That all lends itself to the, uh, to the need for telecommuting. I myself commute every day. I was, I was saying this morning uh, to somebody that until we can vote remotely, I may not myself be able to take advantage of the telecommuting opportunity, but I expect that uh, folks in my office uh, can eventually they bring it into the legislative branch. And certainly there are so many um, in the federal executive branch that can take advantage of this. But I understand what it means to be caught uh, in gridlock, and, uh, and so that's, that's certainly a perspective that I bring. Uh, the opportunity to save money, the opportunity to promote more flexibility in, uh, in, the, in the workforce and in work arrangements, all of that is part of the discussion that we're going to have today. And so I think it's, it's a tremendous win-win opportunity if we pursue this in a more formal way uh, by looking at how to implement, uh, enact and then implement policies. Uh, have people that are dedicated in their focus to the telework option within federal agencies. And um, I agree with the chairman that uh, the federal government's in a position to really model this in some innovative uh, and creative ways. I know many agencies have begun to do that, uh, but we can, of course, do more across the board. So um, looking forward very much to hearing the testimony of all our witnesses today. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarbanes, and uh, we're now prepared to hear from our witnesses, but let me just indicate that we had hoped to have uh, Representative Frank Wolf as our first witness because he has been a pioneer in promoting these <coughs> concepts and ideas and unfortunately could not be here at the moment, and so he might still get an opportunity to come in and should he's able to do so, then we'd look forward to hearing from him. Uh, our panelists are, first of all, Mr. Daniel Green is the Deputy Associate Director of the Center for Employee and <coughs> Family Support and Policy for the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. Green is currently responsible for developing federal employee benefits policy covering the multi-billion dollar retirement and insurance programs administered by OPM. He is also responsible for promoting important employee and family support programs like telework. Mr. Green, thank you so much. We have Mr. Stan Kaczmarek. <coughs> he is the current acting deputy associate administrator for the U.S. General Services Administration's GSA Office of Government-Wide Policy. Mr. Kaczmarek has a has policymaking authority over several key areas, including personal and real property, travel and transportation, information technology, regulatory information, and use of federal advisory committees. Ms. Bernie Steinhardt is the Director of Strategic, Strategic Issues and has held a variety of leadership positions within the U.S. Government Accountability Office, Congress's analytic and investigative arm. Ms. Steinhardt is responsible for examining government-wide management issues and supporting the federal government's transformation to meet 21st century challenges. It is the um, custom and tradition of this committee, as well as it is of <coughs> others, to swear in witnesses, and so if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Uh, the record will show that each one of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we thank you very much, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Green. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss OPM's role in promoting telework in the federal government. Telework and other work-life flexibilities are important tools used by agencies to recruit and retain employees. Telework is also 
an important component of emergency preparedness, helping ensure the federal government can continue core operations from remote locations in case of a short or long-term crisis. According to the latest numbers gathered by OPM, 49 of 80 executive branch agencies had more employees teleworking in 2006 compared to 2005. Those who do telework are teleworking relatively frequently. In fact, over half of them are working from an alternative work site at least once per week. Despite these successes, there was a slight decrease in the total number of teleworkers reported government-wide from 119,248 in 2005 to approximately 111,000 in 2006. This slight overall reduction was largely due to decreased numbers of teleworkers reported at a few large agencies. According to information OPM was given by these agencies, there are two major reasons for the decrease. Data gathering reporting problems and data security concerns. We found that the internal tracking systems used to gather data vary widely in their efficiency and effectiveness, leading to inconsistencies in the information reported to OPM year to year. Agencies are developing internal systems to improve their data collection. The second major issue is data security, which had an impact on actual telework participation. Agencies have justifiably become increasingly concerned with the security of information systems overall and may perceive remote access of a as a kind of particularly problematic. We are working on various initiatives to address this issue and to further explore what security measures are currently in place and what recommendations need to be made to achieve a telework environment that maintains data security. Balancing these challenges are positive drivers for telework that resulted in program growth at the majority of agencies in 2006. One major driver is the recognition by many organizations that telework is a valuable tool to ensure that vital org operations continue during a continuity of operations or pandemic influenza event. OPM strongly recommends in our telework guide that agencies have an effective routine telework program and that as many employees as possible should have telework capability. In my written testimony, I provide information on how three agencies, Department of Labor, U.S. International Trade Commission, and OPM itself have used telework as a means to meet their individual operational objectives. Telework is an important tool in emergency planning, and we continue to support agencies in their efforts to integrate telework into COOP and pandemic influenza preparation. In, response, in responding to President Bush's implementation plan for the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza, OPM issued a completely new guide to telework in the federal government on August 3, 2006. The guide was distributed to all federal agencies and is posted on the interagency telework website, telework.gov. OPM integrates telework in its pandemic planning and guidance briefings for agencies and town hall meetings for federal employees. OPM staff visit federal managers, HR, and technical personnel and others to provide a comprehensive review of policy regarding pandemic preparedness. We are pursuing many activities to foster telework utilization. I would especially like to point out our collaboration with the Chief Human Capital Officers Council on several telework related activities. In February 2007, OPM staff helped organize a Chico Training Academy session focused on agency telework best practices. There were over 50 attendees representing more than 20 agencies at this session, which highlighted the telework efforts of three federal agencies. In addition, OPM is working with the Chico Council Emergency Preparedness Subcommittee, exploring how best to refine current telework definitions and enhance agency metrics in order to strengthen the program. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my remarks, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Proceed to Mr. Kazmaris. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Minority Member Marchant, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today to discuss the General Services Administration's views on how telework programs succeed. 
Successful implementation of telework in the federal government requires effective tools, useful guidance, proactive senior leadership, and flexible implementation. Telework programs succeed when they have the basic tools necessary to support the program. Legislation that would remove barriers to federal telework is welcomed, and we look forward to working with Congress on appropriate telework legislation. Another factor leading to successful telework is useful guidance. Last year, GSA published Federal Management Regulation Bulletin 2006-B3, which established guidelines for alternative workplace arrangements in the federal government. This year, we followed up with FMR Bulletin 2007-B1, covering technology, security, and privacy issues for telework. This document helped establish that telework, when appropriately implemented, can maintain information security. Successful programs ensure that the entire workforce is aware of telework laws, policies, benefits, and practices. To that end, our efforts include a very active listserv and website, along with videos, promotional materials, and press releases. Another critical ingredient in successful programs is aggressive top-level involvement and support. A good example of this is the recently issued challenge by our administrator, Loretta Doan. She is pushing GSA to lead by example and to increase the number of eligible employees participating in telework. The goal is to have 50 percent of eligible GSA employees teleworking at least one or two days per week by the end of calendar year 2010. In furtherance of leading by example and prior to any legislative requirement, GSA will appoint a telework managing officer as called for in both the Senate and House versions of the Telework Enhancement Act of 2007. Proactively demonstrating that she is walking the talk, Administrator Doan recently spent the day working at one of the GSA-sponsored telework centers and announced plans to continue teleworking every month. We encourage other agencies to challenge themselves to use telework to its greatest advantage. We will support their efforts through workplace solutions offered by our Federal Acquisition Service and our Public Building Service. An examination of telework programs shows that flexible implementation is another key to making programs a success. Along these lines, Congress and GSA established a telework center's pilot project in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. These centers offer federal workers a convenient and effective telework alternative to working at home and are located between 16 and 80 miles from downtown D.C. Telework centers add the program flexibility needed to make telework a successful option for those who want to avoid the commute but can't work at home. To illustrate, I would like to show you our new flash video, the first flash video ever to be posted on GSA's website immediately after my conclusion. And in conclusion, GSA believes that successful federal telework programs can be cost effective, significantly reduce traffic, and improve air quality. They can help improve continuity of operations, recruitment and retention of staff, and quality of life for our federal workforce. Characteristics of successful programs include effective tools, useful guidance, proactive senior leadership, and flexible implementation. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have, and now we'd like to show the video. Thank you very much, uh, 
as a matter of fact, uh, your demonstration reminds me of a comment that's often made at my church that I attend where people say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. <laughs> and, so, and so we thank you very much. We'll go to Ms. Steinhardt. Yeah, it's going to be hard to follow that. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Marchant and Mr. Sarbanes. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about the federal government's efforts to uh, promote telework for its employees. Over the years, we've reported on federal telework programs, and over those years, it's been clear to us that the Congress has been rather frustrated in its efforts to try to make telework a more widely used tool. In our view, though, that frustration is likely to continue until agencies bring a more results-oriented approach to managing their telework programs. What do I mean by that? Right now, Congress has quite a few aspirations for telework and OPM, and the agencies have incorporated those aspirations into their policies. And everyone is looking to telework to yield a whole variety of benefits, some of which were mentioned um, in the video, others have been talked about this morning. Agencies are looking to telework to recruit and retain a skilled workforce, to ease traffic congestion and improve quality of life, to uh, provide for continuity of uh, operations in emergency events, and so on. But all of these aspirations have never been translated into program goals. No one is managing to them, no one is setting targets for them, and there's not a lot of information that's being collected to help in evaluating telework programs. When we did a study uh, several years ago of four agencies' telework programs, we identified 24 key practices that agencies should follow based on industry uh, best practice. And four of, the pro of those practices had to do with managing for results. But these practices were among the least employed, and none of the agencies were fully implementing them. None of them had goals or targets or information for evaluation, and without this, uh, Without this information, they had no way of making improvements either. Even in the most basic program performance measures, we found problems. In a study we did in 2005, in which we looked at five other agencies, we found that most of them were measuring employee participation based on their potential to telework. They were counting agreements for telework rather than uh, counting who is actually teleworking or how frequently. And for even more basic measures like eligibility, agencies used such differing methods of calculation that there's no really meaningful picture when you look across the federal government. As a result, we recommended in that report that Congress determine ways to promote more consistent definitions and measurements related to telework, and I would note that the committee's uh, survey found very similar findings that there, were, uh, there was a need for much greater consistency and more meaningful measures. We also went on to suggest that Congress might want to have OPM work with the Chief Human Capital Officers Council to come up with a set of definitions and measures that would allow for a more meaningful assessment of progress in telework programs. Some of the information um, could be improved by more consistent definitions, like eligibility. Um, every agency sets its own pr programs and policies to meet its own uh, local conditions and circumstances, but there, I there shouldn't be widely disparate um, terms for basic things like eligibility. Um, some of this would take, some of this effort would take additional uh, effort to collect for example, on actual usage of telework. Some agencies um, have now put into place time and attendance systems that can measure when people are actually teleworking, the extent to which they're actually working. Others are working on it, others are not. Um, some information might be already available through existing sources. The um, Federal Benefits Survey and the Federal Human Capital Survey, for example, already ask federal employees about their satisfaction with telework. In any case, 
um, it's our view that OPM and the Chico Council are very well positioned to sort through these issues and to consider what information would be most useful to them as they try to manage for results. I want to close by just saying that we would, as we have in the past, we would be pleased to continue to work with you and your staffs as you make this very important effort to um, introduce new legislation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Steinhardt, and um, I want to thank each one of you for your testimony. Uh, we will begin with a round of questions, and um, I will begin with you, Mr. Green. Um, could you describe how successful OPM has been in increasing the awareness and comfort level of managers over the past, uh, say, two, three years? Yes, sir. I don't have met metrics to show a quantitative increase in, in satisfaction. I can talk about the things that we have done. I think the most important document that we've produced is the telework guide, which is on our website and is, was widely distributed to all federal agencies. That guide is a, uh, ha does a couple of things. The primary point is that it is directed straight at telework manag managers of teleworkers and employees wanting to telework and gives them off the shoulder straightforward information on how to maximize that experience. Uh, the other thing that the telework guide does is it talks about issues of importance to agencies in furthering their missions and uh, helping them to integrate telework in some important critical areas, most specifically in their continuity of operations planning and pandemic planning and in dealing with issues of security uh, and protection of data while working remotely. Uh, that's the most important thing we've done. We meet with agencies regularly. Uh, we are working with the Chico Council uh, as um, Ms. Steinhardt uh, alluded uh, to develop matrix and to expand the uh, uh, and discuss issues of definitions of me matrix for measuring telework and for uh, ways to promote uh, a better understanding of what telework can accomplish, what the issues are involving telework and how to deal with them. Um, it has come to the committee's attention that OPM gave notice to its employees that effective October 29th, 2007, that your telework program has been suspended. Um, could you explain to us why OPM has suspended its, its program? Uh, well, that's not actually correct. The program is not suspended, however, uh, Telework has been temporarily suspended or will be temporarily suspended for some employees who are currently teleworking. The overall program is uh, still active, but the employees that uh, are involved in uh, retirement claims operations will be uh, brought in uh, on, on a temporary basis for a couple of reasons. One is, as you know, we're going through a retirement systems modernization effort and involved in that will have to be retraining of employees and those employees will be needed uh, as well to transition from the current uh, legacy systems to the, um, to the new RSM. But a more immediate concern to Director Springer and to managers at uh, OPM is the, uh, the security of personal identifiable information. And that is what the issue there is, is that retirement case files, which have a lot of personal information, of course, about people, are taken home and uh, worked on when, when people telework. And so uh, management wants to find alternative ways of, uh, or ways of protecting that information 
And uh, once that's done, and uh, then there'll be a re-emergence uh, of telework, I, I'm sure. And I think, frankly, that RSM is the, um, will be an ultimate uh, huge help in uh, protecting data because we'll be in an electronic mode and there won't be this same reliance on paper uh, in so, the future. So at best one could then say that there is a temporary suspension of some aspects of the program while it undergoes review to make adjustments that OPM feel is necessary. Yes, sir, exactly. All right. Um, let me just ask uh, Mr. Kazmarzik, uh, what policies has the GSA put in place to help ensure that personally identifiable information is adequately protected, and how can you assure that uh, agency networks are adequately protected when people are doing um, teleworking? Sure. Well, as an agency, we have, um, we, we, we annually inventory all of our IT systems uh, that deal with personally identifiable information to make sure that the program managers are, are aware of their responsibilities. Um, and as far as teleworkers go, teleworkers, of course, receive um, IT security training um, as teleworkers, but also as agency employees, because we're dealing with the same systems in the office that we're dealing with when we work from home. So everybody gets annual IT training. Everybody's aware of the issues. And um, there are techn technological solutions for teleworkers with virtual, priv per virtual private networks, so you can work at home or from a telework center securely and maintain the same um, security over personally identif identifiable information from a remote location as you can in the office. So. Um, it, the general answer is that the policies are in place, the technology is there to support it, and the issue is the same whether you're working from the office or working from another location. And, and you're comfortable that, that this is working well and will continue to work well? In GSA, yes. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop and uh, yield to Mr. Marchant. Thank you. Uh, this question will be for any of the three panelists. Uh, tracking worker productivity while under the telework program seems to vary between agencies and seems to be the major issue uh, when going into teleworking uh, by supervisors and administration. Which agency do you believe has established the fair system to the employee and the agency in tracking worker productivity? Or is there a working uh, system out there to track productivity? Well, I'd like to take a stab at that, if I may. Uh, OPM has advocated for a number of years, uh, and it's not unusual uh, in doing so, that uh, managers manage by results. And those results uh, can be measured in the f by using performance standards that track results and not process or, or um, uh, personal aspects. Uh, so those results can be measured whether a person's working at the office, remotely, at a telework center, wh wherever. And therefore, that's really the answer for a manager that's concerned about getting uh, whether the employee's working when the manager's watching them or not watching them. What did they accomplish? Did they meet their objectives? If I can add on to that, I completely agree with Mr. Green. I mean, the real issue here is creating management cultures that are focused on results, on, on what our goals are and what we need to accomplish and not where a person is and whether you can see them. But that's exactly why we feel so strongly about the telework, the way the telework program is being managed now, because you really can't manage for results until you have clear goals for what you're trying to accomplish with telework. And if you, want to, if you want to increase recruitment and retention, if you want to improve, improve employee morale, you need to have goals for those, and you need to use telework as a tool that can help you accomplish them. You need to set performance expectations for managers, 
so that they know what they're being held accountable for. You need to cascade those expectations down to individual staff so that they know what they're expected to do. And telework is just one way to operate. It really needs to be viewed in the context of what the agency is trying to accomplish. I Thank agree. You. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I agree with the, with the two witnesses. There, there are good managers and bad managers. There are productive employees and less than productive employees. And the issues are the same no matter where the work is, is being carried out. Sometimes uh, as a way of maybe discouraging telework, you'll hear that a manager requires a teleworker to report uh, in advance exactly everything he or she is going to work on for that one day at home. You wouldn't dream of asking that for the other four days that the person is in the office. So it's, uh, we need to have the mindset that the work is independent from the place where it's done. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Barbee. Thank you. Um, can you describe what it means, I guess, Mr. Green, w when you talk about training somebody in teleworking, just give me a sense of what, what, what you envision in that. I mean, what does it mean to train a person in telework or offer them best pa practices or what have you? Um, certainly. Some, uh, most of it's rather mundane, frankly. It's things like, uh, ma again, managing to results and that an employee understands that they're responsible for their work and it, that doesn't change whether they're working remotely or working in the office, that they have a responsibility to do their job. Uh, they don't have, a, uh, I mean, that's basically it. The other things, though, are, are practical things like um, there should be a security, uh, there should be a safety evaluation done of the work site, what, whether it's at home or the telework center, to make sure that uh, they're working in a safe and secure environment, that uh, information they do bring home uh, or use on their computer, whether it's a VPN site or not, is protected, that, um, that there's an understanding, and, and we recommend written telework agreements to support this, that there's, a written, that there's an understanding between the manager and the employee as to uh, when they'll be teleworking, how they will be um, able to communicate with each other uh, while teleworking uh, and, and what the expectations are. Not necessarily a blow by blow minute of what I'm going to be doing while I'm teleworking, but generally what I'll be working on and, uh, and as I say, most especially being able to communicate with the employee during the day. So, Ms. Steinhardt, I guess um, the concept of the manager being trained in telework is as important as the employee being trained. And would you regard it as useful to think in terms of there being kind of a transition period or, or having workers transition to, to telecommuting status during, the tr during which transition they would be understanding better the managing for results uh, imperative and so forth? I, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I would envision a, necessarily a transition period. Clearly managers need to know what the expectations are as well. But I think the key here is really creating a culture within the organization. And that obviously is going to take a while to occur. But it needs to be the, everyone in an organization needs to understand that they're working towards something. Telework shouldn't be regarded as an employee reward. It, that's not what it's about at all. It's a way to get work done, and it needs to be viewed as a tool to accomplish some organizational goal. Managers do need to understand that, and it's part of, but it's part of a larger kind of change in the way that they uh, view their work. And they need to be, managers need to be held accountable for what the organization is trying to accomplish through telework. It's not just the employee, it's managers as well. Thank you. Mr. Kazmarczyk, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, is there a difference between a telework center and a satellite work location? I'm trying to understand, um, in other words, could you have, could you have a satellite office that 
itself was the hub of telecommuters who were working from home as distinguished from a telework center that people go to during the day and then they're teleworking from that center to the main agency location or am I dancing on the head of a pin here? What it no, satellite cen centers are more common in the private sector than in the government, but it, a satellite center might be set up by a corporation if they had a concentration of employees in a geographic area a certain distance from the, ma from the main office, and then those employees would report to that satellite center to work every day. Now, um, if, th if those responsibilities included some kind of uh, uh, client service or sales function, maybe the satellite center is their main office and they do, quote, telecommute while they're on the road, uh, I guess they could also work from home, be set up to work from home as well as the satellite center as for, uh, for continuity of operations. The telework center, the concept of the telework center is that every agency can use them. So you have on, you know, one day a week, two days a week, different federal employees from different agencies using okay. a, a center that's geographically convenient to their home. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Steinhardt, uh, you've placed a great deal of emphasis on having clear goals as a way to facilitate um, the utilization of, of teleworking. Uh, do you think that it would be very helpful to have government-wide goals that every agency would, would, would be expected to adhere to or pursue as well as individual agency goals that would be left to the latitude of the agencies themselves? That's a really good question. I, I would say yes. Um, there are some goals uh, that are not necessarily unique to an agency. Um, some are. For example, recruitment and retention, employee morale. Those, I think, are related. They certainly, every agency uh, has some effort to attract a skilled workforce to maintain high employee morale, but the conditions are very agency to agency. But commute time, for example, I would think that all agencies, uh, that that is a government-wide issue, and so reducing congestion, reducing energy use might be government-wide goals. They're not specific to any one agency. That's just by way of example. In your testimony, you also mentioned awareness training as a way of, of, of helping um, facilitate movement. Um, you, are you aware of any results uh, or how much help that might have been or appeared to be? Um, I'm not aware that there have been any kinds of evaluations there. Um, I would say just anecdotally based on GAO's own experience, the best, uh, there clearly needs to be clear guidance on what telework is and what conditions uh, it's available, under what conditions it's available to employees and the kinds of uh, procedures, rules, policies they need to follow. But I think one of the best um, measures to promote telework is actual experience with teleworking. And um, particularly among staff who, who believe that it would be helpful to them on an intermittent basis, you know, where they might occasionally want to telework, once people become familiar with it, both employees and managers, it seems to be uh, much more widely accepted. People know how to, how to use it, and then people may actually start using telework on a more regular basis. Um, Mr. Kazmarczyk. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that you will propose legislation to address travel pay associated with long distance telework. Could could you share some more thinking? Yes, that? this is mostly based on the experience of an agency such as Patent and Trademark Office that uh, uh, they employ a lot of full-time teleworkers from other locations and they find that, uh, uh, well, PTO is always one of the, the best examples because they have uh, you know, cases and they're the processing and, and you, have a, you have widgets that you can measure for productivity. So they can demonstrate that uh, people who work from home actually produce more widgets, get through more cases, 
um, over the course of a week than people who are in the office. So they have the opportunity to hire people who have the right skill set, but uh, who, who live elsewhere out of the Washington, D.C. area, or who would like to move out of the Washington, D.C. area. So, um, for example, if somebody lived in San Francisco and wanted to telecommute full time out of their home uh, to PTO in Crystal City, um, that can be done. The issue becomes uh, if the person needs to come into the office for, you know, periodically for training or orientation, that then becomes a travel expense that the agency has to pay because their, their home office is San Francisco and not, not in Crystal City. Now, if, if for one person, it's not a big deal, but if you had you know, several hundred people in this situation and you had to bring them all in periodically for orientation or training or just for face-to-face for -face meeting, it could be a considerable extra travel expense to the agency. So it's felt that that's act, that acts as a deterrent to um, encouraging these types of virtual work arrangements. It seems to me that uh, Administrator Doan is a bit more aggressive than uh, some other agency directors and agency heads uh, and has actually uh, laid out some pretty aggressive ideas and goals. Um, does this include uh, the establishment of telework centers um, as well? She, she is very much interested in, in promoting telework centers. Um, the first step is to, is to increase the utilization of our existing 14 centers. And uh, she's going to, um, she plans to telecommute herself at each one of them and to, to invite other senior agency leaders to, to join her on these days and see for themselves um, how it is. She also plans to, for GSA, to centralize uh, the funding for telework centers so that uh, there'll be a, a pot of money that will be buy a certain number of seats and then GSA managers won't have a, a financial constraint themselves, won't come out of their, their program budget. They can take advantage of the telework centers. And once we get the current uh, 14 telework centers um, fully utilized, then we'd be happy to look at, at other locations as warranted. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Margent, do you have any additional? I don't have any additional questions for this panel. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes, do you have any? Just a couple real quick. Um, are you aware of any agencies that have advanced enough with this that they are actually in their recruitment of, of new employees holding this out as one of the options that's available as a way of motivating the hirings. And Mr. Chairman, I ask that because I know that the Partnership for Public Service just launched this major effort to recruit, I think in the next couple of years, 200,000 or so mission critical federal employees. And I would imagine that the uh, the ability to hold that out as an opportunity to folks might help with recruitment, so I was curious about that. If uh, GAO, if I can offer us sure. as an example, um, we include telework, uh, flexible work arrangements including telework as part of our recruitment uh, materials and we actually administer a survey to new staff to find out the kinds of things that um, attract them to the agency and those flexible work arrangements are among the top ten reasons, so they re remain a key part mm -hmm. of our recruitment and retention strategy. Great, great. OPM itself includes uh, teleworking capability in its recruitment efforts, and I would also point out in my testimony I speak a little bit about the efforts of uh, the U.S. International Trade Commission and how they are using uh, telework as, an, as a recruitment tool as well, and there are other examples. Administrator Doan has, re has uh, required that uh, all the managers go through all the position descriptions in the entire agency and designate them as to whether they are basically eligible or not for telework. And then as vacancies come up against those position descriptions, the actual job announcement will, will note that it's a telework eligible position. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank this panel. We appreciate your being here and your testimony and your excuse. Thank you. As we are preparing for panel three, I will go ahead with the introduction of our panelists. Um, Ms. Margaret J. A. Pertolin, 
was sworn in as Deputy Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Deputy Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO, in April 2007. As Deputy Director of the USPTO, she administers the laws of grant and patents and trademarks and the day-to-day -day management of the $1.9 billion agency and its more than 8,500 employees. Mr. Lee J. Loftus is the Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice. He is responsible for department-wide financial reporting, budget formulation and execution, accounting operations, assets, fortune fund, operational support, procurement and debt management support. He also oversees department-wide facilities, management, human resources, business services, and planning. Let me welcome both of you, and it is our custom and tradition, if you would stand to be sworn in, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We thank you very much for being here with us, and we will proceed and begin with Ms. Perkman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Marchant, Mr. Sarbanes, and the subcommittee and distinguished guests. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the USPTO's telework programs. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss them because it's very important that leaders of agencies work to balance home life and work requirements. And if I may take a moment, I would just like to recognize my sister, Megan Corder, and my fiance, Dan Kennery, who often remind me to make sure that I have a work-life balance. On behalf of the agency, I thank the subcommittee for taking a careful look at telework issues in the 110th Congress and look forward to working with you in the future. The success of the USPTO telework programs is driven by top-level agency support and clearly defined then communicated performance measures. We trust our employees to perform their responsibilities without micromanaging observation. These are fundamental principles that work well in a telework environment. For very practical reasons, the USPTO is changing the boundaries of old workplace patterns. Our vision is for our employees to perform their responsibilities regardless of their physical location. As a result, the telework program has led to improved employee retention, higher productivity, and increased morale. Over the past 10 years, we have identified a number of important guiding principles. These are our lessons for creating and sustaining a successful telework program. They are, first, a successful telework program is contingent upon careful planning. We started small, with a pilot of only 18 examining attorneys and continually assessed our progress along the way. Over the course of the last 10 years, we have expanded our telework initiative and currently have 3,609 employees participating, which is 40.7% of total positions at the USPTO. Second, the USPTO management views telework as a corporate business strategy and human capital flexibility. Third, our managers build and maintain a relationship of trust with employees, whether they are working on the Alexandria campus or at home. Since the nature of patent and trademark work lends itself to telework, our managers are very comfortable with results-based management techniques. They also understand the relevance of devising and clearly communicating performance measures. Managers and employees set and agree upon a list of goals, ensuring a mutual understanding of expectations. Fourth. Involving labor unions in the development of telework programs engages represented employees and increases the likelihood of union support. At the beginning of our first pilot program, we initiated a labor and management working group to develop guidelines, procedures, and selection criteria for telework participation. Today, the group meets on a regular basis addressing arising telework program issues. Fifth. At the USPTO, we believe that training and education are a necessary precondition for and sustaining requirement of a successful program. Before being granted the privilege of teleworking, employees receive non-IT and IT management training. Six, 
Having a talented telework coordinator at the USPTO has proven extremely beneficial to our organization. Telework is a winning proposal with numerous benefits. For many employees, telework means less time on the road, which also translates to lower auto emissions, gas consumption, and reduced traffic congestion. USPTO employees alone who telework collectively save more than 613,000 gallons of gas per year and save more than $1.8 million annually in fuel costs. Additionally, there is combined reduction in emissions of more than 9,600 tons per year. For the agency, the benefits have included retention of seasoned, high-quality employees, maximizing use of space, avoiding the cost of acquiring additional real estate as the agency has grown, and maintaining high performance. Performance has been measured over the years, and we've been able to compare our performance and quality standards both inside and outside the telework program. Over the past decades, the USPTO has realized the benefits of implementing a robust telework program and has demonstrated that telework is a business strategy that works for our employees, our agency, and the economy. So I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee on this issue. Thank you very much. And before I go to Mr. Loftus, I'd like to just take a moment and acknowledge the presence of two dear friends of mine who stopped by. Um, Dr. Herbert B. Slutsky, who is the retired uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Health Department for the City of Chicago, retired university professor and management consultant, and his wonderful wife, Maureen, who is a retired educator. We're delighted that you both stopped by, and thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Loftus, would you proceed? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Davis, Ranking Member Marchant, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this morning to discuss telework. The Justice Department was one of the earliest agencies to initiate a telework pilot program through our participation in the 1990 Federal Flexible Workplace Pilot, known as FlexiPlace. That early program, developed by the Office of Personnel Management and the General Services Administration, was established in response to a recommendation by the President's Council on Management Improvement and was implemented with support from the White House, Congress, and the major unions representing the federal employees. It was designed to test alternatives to the traditional work environment. Since that time, DOJ organizations have continued to look for opportunities to expand the use of telework where it supports the Department's mission. However, an inherent challenge to DOJ's ability to expand telework is the law enforcement, national security, and intelligence gathering nature of what we do. We have always recognized the practical reality that certain positions, correctional officers in a prison, deputy marshals on duty in a courtroom, and evidence technicians, for example, must perform their duties at specific locations. The department's overall telework participation rate is currently at 4% of eligible staff. Eight of our non-law enforcement components have participations over 6%, and our law enforcement entities continue to look for ways to utilize telework flexibilities. The justice organizations with the top four highest participation rates are the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, or COPS, at 30%, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives at 21 percent, the Office of Justice Programs at 13 percent, and our Civil Division at 12 percent. Additionally, my own organization has a participation rate of over 10 percent. Let me briefly describe some of these programs. ATF has 504 employees, or 21 percent of its eligible workforce, teleworking. ATF's success is in part attributed to a comprehensive communication plan that educates employees and managers on how and when telework can best be used to meet the ATF mission and support ATF employee efforts to balance work and family responsibilities. ATF regularly surveys its managers to determine the effectiveness of telework arrangements and to obtain ideas on how to further enhance the program. The department's civil division is comprised of over 1,100 attorneys, paralegals, and support staff and civil has been working successfully to make telework a viable option across the division. In my organization, as the head of Justice Management Division, I can report that we have more than 98 employees on telework, over 10 percent of our total JMD workforce. 
My organization has everything from attorneys to accounting staff paying bills to librarians to painters and to plumbers. So we're a good example of a highly diversified organization where telework works well in some jobs and less so in others. Last week I discussed telework with my senior managers and directors as a prelude to wider supervisory training on telework flexibilities we are doing throughout November in my organization. We also help facilitate department-wide department -wide awareness about telework through our DOJ Work Life website. On this site, DOJ managers and employees can learn about telework flexibilities and how to participate. Telework is an important part of three major department initiatives. Human capital, as it relates to recruiting and retaining a diverse and talented workforce for the 21st century. Continuity of operations, or COOP, and our pandemic planning efforts. In closing, at Justice, we are trying to use telework where it makes sense in a law enforcement and national security organization. At the same time, we're trying to use telework without opening ourselves to increasing cyber threats to our systems, networks, and the critical national security, law enforcement, and personally identifiable information contained in those systems and networks. Mr. Chairman, once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Be pleased to answer any questions you or the panel may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Philosophus. And we will proceed with uh, questions. Uh, let me just begin uh, with you, Ms. Peterlin. Um, what position classifications are eligible to telework at the uh, Patent and Trademark Office? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have 17 programs at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because we have found that based on the work that our employees are doing, we may need some flexibility. But if you look at our two largest programs, the eligibility re requirements are quite consistent. And that is the employee needs to be on a full-time status. They need to have a fully successful rating. They need to demonstrate the ability to work independ independently. They need to have no performance or disciplinary actions against them. And they need to have high-speed broadband internet at home. And so those generally who would be ineligible then, sir, would just be primary, whose primary responsibilities include interaction with internal employees or customers. And uh, so you have a level of, of, of comfort that the individuals who are eligible are going to be able to function at a pretty high level without supervision, in a sense, or a certain level of supervision? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, certainly, um, at the USPTA, USPTO, it is our hope that our managers are still uh, engaged, very engaged with our employees who are teleworking. So that type of supervision would still be ongoing. In our trademarks, business unit, that would mean you have full signatory authority that you can make the final determination about whether a trademark like Coca-Cola should or should not be registered. Because we want to make sure that our employees have the sufficient training and experience that we're setting them up for success. And then everyone in our managers and our employees participate in the telework training program. And that gives us additional confidence. I wish all of my employees were like that. But, but could you also explain why, and I think that you have one of the more successful programs and activities, and, and, and why the USPTO has been so successful at teleworking? Um, I, yes, sir. I, I appreciate the question because I think if you had um, called us to testify 10 years ago, we would have a different story, sir. We would say that we are embarking on it, and we would only have had 18 examining attorneys. I think the reason why 10 years later um, we are very grateful to be described as a success story is because we have very carefully progressed, looked at, assessed the results. We started small. We assessed our results. We implemented training. We implemented the necessary IT security, and we kept pushing ourselves. We kept saying, these results are great. We're getting 99% return on our surveys with employees saying, I feel better about my job. We have product in productivity increases of 10% in our patents and trademark area. And so we kept seeing excellent results as we became more and more confident over time. So I think our success 
today is because we were willing to start and then the successes kept building one on the other. That being said, sir, certainly there have been challenges along, along the way and some managers needed to be uh, brought to the issue and some employees needed to gain comfort in teleworking. What advice would you give to other agencies um, if you had the opportunity to do so to increase their telework numbers? Uh, sir, I think um, the, the best advice is always the advice that um, taps into a specific experience that we have confidence in. And for us, um, that has been to have the necessary IT security structure in place, have training for managers and employees, identify what the management criteria will be. If, if your organization is already managing by results, then you're setting the necessary preconditions to have a successful telework program. If it's managing by observation, then you probably don't have the necessary preconditions in place for teleworking. And so I would say start off by having a good management structure, by managing by objectives, and that's successful for you whether you're teleworking or not. Then engage your managers at every level, both at the senior level of the organization and the first level managers. Participate in the necessary training. Endorse that training. And then um, start a program, start a pilot program, have assessment metrics for the program, survey the individuals, be willing to make adjustments to your program, but then move out. You know, identify the successes. One success for the PTO, sir, if I may continue my answer, is that we are hiring at the PTO because of our strategic planning in a situation where we found we were understaffed. 1,200 examiners per year over five years. We have a beautiful new campus on, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, which would still not hold the rate of increase that we have found necessary for us to meet our requirements. And so without the telework program in place, we would not be able to even hire sufficiently to meet our mission requirements. So teleworking for us is sort of a, a bottom line flexibility in order for us to achieve our mission. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to stop and uh, yield to Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What what is your, do you have a defined uh, stated goal as as to where you want to be ten years from now as far as your telework program? Sir, what we are doing right now at the USPTO is we are looking at whether or not we should um, move to a nationwide workforce, which would we have a distributed workforce across the United States. A lot of our uh, on our patent side, most of our patent examiners have multiple degrees. Um, we have many PhDs. The examination process is a very rigorous process. And because we can't make that job any easier, the way to retain and attract talented people for us is to try to make the job as flexible as possible. So our stated goal right now is to look at what a nationwide workforce would look like. I think if you asked us maybe even a year ago, we would have said, teleworking is great and since then we've looked at it and said teleworking may be an interim step to a distributed workforce um, as a nationwide workforce so that if a major company has a layoff there will be many talented people that we would love to have working and recruiting at the USPTO but their church is in another state, their family's in another state, and their kids are in high school in another state. And so if we could give them an opportunity there, that benefits the USPTO, and it also develops the loyalty to an organization that we'd like to benefit from. So I don't know that our 10-year goal is teleworking as an end goal. It may be teleworking as a means to a nationwide workforce. If someone comes to you and, they're, and they know that they are obviously qualified for the job they're applying, and they know that you would like to hire them and they pr and are they free to propose to you the terms of their telemark of uh, telework or can they say I will be happy to take this job but I want to telework three days a week or I mean are they free to do that or do you hire them based on uh, them doing the job in the office and then negotiate the telework with them um. Thank you for the question. That's something that we are looking at in terms of 
the types of flexibilities we can have because one of our one of our pressures as an organization, as I mentioned to the chairman, is a, a real estate issue and whether or not um, someone in the teleworking program, specifically in patents, would still need a, a dedicated office space or they would be involved in shared office space. We don't, unless we're hiring a, someone who had retired from the PTO and decided to come back, and we very fortunately have that. You'll be hearing from someone in the next panel, sir, who was in our trademark side and then left um, enjoyed a successful time in the private sector and then decided to come back to the PTO and is teleworking. But there is an initial period of time, if, if you're not a return employee, there's an initial period of time um, so that you can have your full signatory authority or you have, you have a, your certified exam is passed on the patent side before we um, have a telework relationship established. And that is, again, to make sure that we're setting our employees up for success. Mr. Loftus, uh, the percentages you gave on your various uh, uh, the various departments are most of those people on a one day. I mean, what what of the percentages you gave us that partic participate? What percentage of those are? Is it one day, two days, three days? It, it, uh, it, those percentages obviously were for any any part of the job that they telework, right? Correct. At least half of those folks are on one day a week telework schedules. There may be folks who work more than one day a week. That may also be situational, meaning their basic telework schedule may be one day a week, but if the situation allows it, maybe their supervisor permits them to work an additional day, and that's more situational in the way we view the schedule. I, I think you probably recall I think was it last year or the year before where someone that had done I think was involved in some kind of a telework project at the VA had taken some um, some hard files or had some files at home that they were stolen yeah. from their home. Um, uh, it was not good. <laughs> there was nothing good about it. Uh, those are obviously some of the drawbacks and some of the pitfalls of telework. Uh, do you guys, ha since that incident, have you, you know, sat down and talked about it and said, okay, this this is something about telework that we we can't aff afford to have happen and uh, taken some, some uh, corrective action? That is something that concerns us. While we want to encourage telework at the Department of Justice, we want to do it even though we're a law enforcement organization where some jobs simply are location specific and probably aren't that suitable for telework. But nonetheless, we want to encourage telework where, wherever we can. One of the barriers that I see, though, in, in all candor, is the fact of information security and working with classified information. The example that you point out is very much in our, in our minds as we deal with these issues. Uh, when we look at the cyber threats that are out there now and that are increasing, we want to make sure that we're not exposing the agency and the information we have to risk as we expand telework. I think when telework, if you set the clock back a few years, it was, I think, very easy to, for folks to say, well, I have a home computer and I'll be able to work from home and things will be just fine. Just having a home computer, I think, is no longer uh, just the way you need to look at telework. Those home computers do uh, insert an element of risk in the agency operations. Certainly they do in, in an intelligence or national security operation. Uh, we don't control that security domain over your, your home computer. And since we don't control that, that does it introduce an element of risk and that's something that we want to be very vigilant when we, when we manage for those type of risks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marchant, uh, Mr. Sarbe. Thank you. You, um, Ms. Peterlin, talked about how you would bring people together, uh, labor unions and management and so forth, uh, and others to tackle challenges that have been pre presented with respect to telecommuting. Can you just give an example of something that came up, a theme, uh, a problem that was being identified kind of across the board, if, if, if it was? that you were able to take on and push through and now look back and say we were able to 
you know, move past that. Um, certainly. I th I'll give you a, a current example, if I may, and it's one that I think um, I confess that we're still pushing through and working past, but I think it's important to use this example because it, um, it reveals how the team comes together. Um, we had a virtual art, we have technology centers at the USPTO that look at particular types of innovation and within those technology centers we have then art units. We had an art unit that became a virtual art unit where the art unit, its uh, managers and the examiners went home and worked together virtually. There were still other people in the technology center so you had in some ways some people in the same office teleworking and some still in the office because we were trying to test could we send an entire unit this, at this level home. What we found is that we need to make sure that the people who are were still at the USPTO don't carry all the burden of training the new examiners that are on board because we saw that, um, and this is something that our union has raised to our attention and some of our employees in the survey raised to our attention, that people had an inclination to want to seek training from the person that they could go next door to their office and there was a little bit of a barrier of thinking, oh, I don't want to call them because they're at home. And so what that to me raises just a management issue of going back and saying, they're not at home, they're teleworking today and you right. should, they want you to pick up the phone and talk to them. And so this is a, an example of an issue. I think it's a type of issue you were asking me to. Right talk about. And I would say that we're, we're, we just finished the virtual art unit pilot, so we just had this assessment about the fact that some people are reluctant, just personally reluctant, to reach out to the teleworking trainer more so than the trainer that may be a few doors down. And so we're going to approach that by talking to our managers and saying, look, it's important that you, you don't have that instinct because that instinct is, uh, is a bit artificial. You know, the trainer at home is, is, is competent and interested and wants to be involved in training as well. Right. Okay. That, that's a great example. Um, uh, either one can answer this question or both. Um, and I, it picks up on what Mr. Marchant was saying. Um, as a practical matter, uh, I mean, we talk about telecommuting or teleworking, the definition qualifying based on one day a week or two days a week or 20% over two weeks or whatever. But I mean, if somebody gets into a good telecommuting arrangement, is it not the case, practically speaking, that they're going to move towards a kind of full-time telecommuting arrangement? Or is that, am I missing, I mean, because particularly in terms of saving space and other things, I would imagine that until you get to that kind of tipping point, maybe you're not getting the benefit of it so much. So I'm just... I'd be curious across, in both offices, um, across the workforce that is telecommuting, I mean, how many are in that full-time telecommuting category? We don't have many in the full-time telecommuting category yet. One of the things that is coming down the pipe, though, that I think will help in this area is the ability to track telework and the job series of the folks who do telework and how frequently they telework. We at the Department of Justice are on the National Finance Center at the Department of Agriculture supporting our payroll systems and they have a new system or, or new to us called StarWeb and StarWeb allows us to start tracking at a time and attendance record keeping level, meaning a very detailed level, uh, how often people are telecommuting and we can really get now for the first time really good statistics on who's doing it, how frequently they're doing it, if the success of what they've already done allows them to expand their use of telecommuting. So I think that gives us an advantage over the more anecdotal data we had a couple of years ago. So I'm looking forward to the fact that we can use that kind of information that will help us target other areas in the department where telecommuting may be a viable option and people just haven't looked at it yet in those okay. areas. Yes, sir. Um, I have a lot of statistics in front of me and so I want to give you what I think might be the most useful statistics. And it is, we have found that it isn't always the case that if you're teleworking one day now that you'll migrate to four days because what we are trying to do is, uh, the reason why we have 17 programs at the USPTO is because we find that depending on the business needs 
of the of the particular mission, um, you may be able to. Your job may allow you to telework one day a week. We have uh, customer call center personnel who work four days a week, but the m the requirements of their job would allow that if they consolidate the administrative type of work into one day, they can telework during that day. So then we have other positions where uh, they can telework four days a week. And so uh, right now, at, in our Trademarks examining attorneys working from home four days a week. Um, we have 246 examining attorneys working at home four days a week. We have 26 who work at home three days a week, seven two days a week, and 55 one day a week. So depending on the position and the requirements of the position, that does influence the number of days where teleworking will make sense, and which does impact the return on investment that right. the agency might. Are the ones that are working four days a week like, does that mean one day a week they're coming into main location or they're just working four days a week according to a flex schedule? Uh, it could be that they're working four days a week from home. And so one day yeah. a week they would be in the office. We have a require, there's a requirement that folks come in for one hour uh, per week to establish their um, duty station for pay purposes. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, Mr. Loftus, um, recognizing that the Department of Justice is a law enforcement agency, isn't there a large number of law enforcement positions that could be eligible for telecommute? Mr. Chairman, yes, I think that is true. I think there are law enforcement uh, positions that are suitable for telework, but it depends, what we've learned, it depends on an individual's duties, and I can give you an example of that. Uh, at Justice, we have a job series called Investigator or Criminal Investigators, and we have investigators across our law enforcement components. And at the ATF, we happen to have a large number, I think nearly 400 uh, investigators who are telecommuting, and they're doing that very successfully. And these are investigators that go out into uh, the industry and they do reviews and they write reports. And ATF has found it very uh, viable for those uh, investigators to do that report writing and ass assimilate their information from telecommuting centers or from their homes. So that's working very well. At the same time, in that same broad job series, investigator or criminal investigator, we have investigators at DEA and FBI who have really quite different duties. They may be working on case investigations that involve informant information, may involve undercover operations, it may involve classified information. So those investigators really have duties that are more site specific and they come into the office for the protection of the data. So you have similar sounding jobs but with actually quite different duties. So when we look at our opportunities for teleworking, what we found is we have to go below the job series and really look at the specific duties of the individuals. But your point's an excellent one. What we've learned, again, I think from some of the new data we're getting, is the opportunities for attorneys, the civil division example. Uh, the opportunity for attorneys to telework is one that I think there's some potential there. And we've had pockets, my organization has a uh, small number of attorneys, but they have some of those telework. Civil division's been successful. The United States Attorneys Organization has attorneys at telework. So there are people in the justice law enforcement environment uh, that can telework, and we're looking for those opportunities. The Department of Justice has some innovative programs for telework, but we think that some of its bureaus are lagging. Recently, the ATF gave a group of 50 employees in the position of legal instrument examiner the choice of relocating to West Virginia or leaving employment at ATF. West Virginia would be a three-hour commute for many of these uh, employees. Telework was not an option made available to them. The reason given was that it would require automation of form processing which ATF has claimed would cost uh, $2.7 million. Could you explain how the ATF arrived at $2.7 million to automate the work of the legal instrument examiners 
And aside from money, what would prevent the legal instrument examiners from teleworking? Mr. Chairman, that case is one where I, I'd prefer to be able to get back to you on the specifics. I do, do know that ATF was concerned with the costs of any system improvements which would be needed to make telework a viable option there. But if, if, if uh, I may, I would prefer to get back to you with specifics. That falls again in the, in the category where I think we're serious about looking for opportunities to make these uh, telework options available to our staff but sometimes there are, are barriers. Thank you. Um, in a letter sent on May 7, 2007, the subcommittee asked the Department of Justice whether the agency excludes any categories of employees from teleworking. Uh, DOJ provided a long list of job categories covering over 47,000 employees that are excluded from telework. DOG Jay said these jobs are excluded because they require handling secure materials or performing on-site activities. Just some of the categories of jobs that are not eligible for telework at the Department of Justice include building maintenance intelligence analysts, security specialists, supply program manager, language specialists, legal clerk, and paralegal specialists. That's just a sample that DOJ identified and actually identified many more jobs that are excluded from telework. I can understand why it would be difficult for some of these employees to work from home. For example, an employee performing building and maintenance obviously needs to be present at the building in order to perform maintenance on it. But DOJ's list includes a number of jobs where at least based on the job titles, it seems like the employees may be able to perform at least some of their duties from an alternate work site. Do legal clerks and paralegals need to be present all of the time? Can't they perform research and other work from alternate work sites? And what happens if an employee in one of these job categories asked to telework, is that employee automatically excluded based on his or her job title? Or does DOJ look at specific responsibilities and activities of each employee who would like to telework? We need to look at the specific duties. I don't want to have a justice environment where we have such sweeping decisions made to exclude people based on job series alone because of the things I've already pointed out in the sense that criminal investigators or investigators may have the same job title but very different duties, so I think we need to look at the underlying duties. And while we did have a long list of jobs that were excluded, 59,000 jobs were deemed eligible for telecommuting. And if, if if one were to take an extremely, I think, restrictive view of the eligible positions, you might say only 40,000 jobs at Justice would be eligible for telecommuting. I think we've tried to be optimistic and include as many jobs as we can to make them eligible, which is how we got up to the 59,000 uh, number of eligible positions. So I think we're trying to give telecommuting the benefit of the doubt and not exclude people based on job title alone. Uh, agents. I think if you look at the fact that we have 22,000 agents, we have 30,000 plus correctional officers, there's 50,000 positions alone that one could say, well, those you just can't telecommute. The correctional officers may be one thing when you have to be present at the institution and, and there at the, the uh, prison, but the agents. We do have a small number of agents where we're experimenting with uh, telecommuting, and I think that's an example where we're trying not to exclude people automatically just on a series title, but give people an opportunity to try it, see if it works, see if the supervisors like it. As some of the other panelists have talked about, results are what really matter here. If we can do this and get good results, then I think our position would be we want to be open to that type of uh, consideration for our employees. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Peterlin, as I noted earlier, Representatives Marchant Waxman, 
Davis and I sent a letter on May 7, 2007 to 25 departments and agencies requesting current information on the agency's telework information. In response to that letter, we received general information from the Department of Commerce, but no specific information on the agencies within the department, including the Patent and Trademark Office. Given the apparent success of PTO's program, it would be helpful to have more specific data in order to compare it with other agency programs. Would you be willing to submit for the record answers to the questions we asked in our May 7th uh, letter? Uh, yes, sir, we'd be delighted to. Thank you both very much. And uh, Mr. Sarbanes, do you have any additional questions? Just real quick, um, what um, at, at the USPTO, is there any expense that you as a policy are willing to incur with respect to um, outfitting the, the telecommuter's home office, or do you put that burden exclusively on the employee? Uh, no, sir. We pay for the, um, as we are looking at our uh, cost benefit analysis, and some of this is always an X factor of the the retention value to the employee, the morale, the productivity increases that we see, we outfit their uh, home offices. And we actually also pay for the cost of the telework training for the manager and the employee. Okay. But we still find that that cost benefit analysis leads to benefit for the agency. The, the two objections that I can think of are the things that, that um, I focus on the most as, as obstacles or the resistance to teleworking or one this whole productivity question where I'm I'm completely assured by the testimony that if, if the managing to results is done properly that that is easily overcome as an objection the other I guess would just be this this less tangible esprit de corps dimension the, the notion that if people are far flung and you don't see them I mean this is the good part of FaceTime there's the bad part of FaceTime right <laughs> The good part of FaceTime is that you see the folks and it, it helps to congeal the spirit within the office and so forth. Um, can you speak to that? I mean, I guess the extent everybody who's teleworking in your office is still coming in to a central location for some period of time during the week. It offers opportunities for meetings and, and other group activities, if you will. Uh, that they can address that issue of esprit de corps, but maybe you could just talk about that uh, briefly, yeah. and uh, Mr. Loftus as well, if you'd like. Uh, yes, sir, I, I appreciate your focus on that question because it's a, it is a focus that a lot of our senior management have spent time on. What are the necessary collaboration tools? Our examining attorneys and our patent examiners need collaboration tools and, and search tools in order to do the, the, the work um, that they perform in, in order to complete this examination, but they also need collaboration tools in order to be able to connect. I think this is something where you don't ever reach a, um, a plateau. It's always going to be a management issue. How do you connect with someone who is uh, living in Michigan if the main office is in Alexandria, Virginia? And I think some of that has to do with the comfort of the employee and feeling that they can connect through the collaboration tools. Some of the tools that we have are simple or as basic as telephone, telephone, voicemail, email, but we do, uh, we're doing more and more to hold a town hall. In our trademarks area, we had a, a video town hall so that the teleworkers actually logged on from home mm -hmm. on their computers and they had an all hands meeting or a town hall meeting and so I think making more frequent use of town hall meetings or using instant messaging or you, you have to use the tools that the IT tools that currently exist um, and then you also have to have managers who will just as a good manager does swing by a cubicle every now and then just to see what's going on swings by electronically the mm -hmm. employee's cubicle. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that I think that that's a challenge. I think it's okay for it to be a challenge, to recognize it as a challenge, and then you just have to figure out how to, to reduce the impact of that challenge. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarbanes. I note that we've been joined by uh, Mr. Cummins, and I know when you have a work 
schedule and load as heavy as his, it's difficult to be in three or four places at one time. So thank you, Mr. Cummins. Did you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, for acknowledging my schedule. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll be very brief. I just have one question. Um, we're finding that despite um, the legislative leeway uh, to doing so, agencies are not promoting telework programs as broadly as, you know, I would think they would have. Are there certain barriers to this, and is there a legislative solution? <coughs> Did you hear my question? Okay. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'll go first. And sure. Keep your voice up. Yes, sir. In terms of uh, barriers, I think at the Department of Justice, what we found so far, other than inherent law enforcement issues where there's a deputy marshal who has to be on duty in a courtroom. So if you look past what I'll call those inherent site location jobs to the jobs that are more suitable for telework, uh, you need tone at the top where senior leadership at your agency or department uh, says the telework is an important program for the agency, it's important for the the operation of the agency and it is important for the quality of work life for our, our staff. So you need positive tone at the top. You need open-minded supervisors. And what we are finding at the Department of Justice as, as telework expands and as we see pockets of success, for instance, with our investigators at ATF, with the attorneys in the civil division, with other jobs, as you see pockets of success, I think that breaks down barriers in the rest of the department where people may have said, well, I don't think such and such a job is very suitable. We can demonstrate else, elsewise. So it comes back to being able to have open-minded managers and people who are behind the program and that are supportive of it. That's, that is what we're finding at Justice. What I'd like to add to that list, sir, and what has been a primary issue for us, one of the barriers to telework is having the development of a reliable and secure computer system so that our folks could actually get immediate access to the same documents that they would have been able to have access to were they in their office and that they are able to download them reliably. reliably. So because we were able to start small years ago, we've been actually able to anticipate and include in our program designs and upgrades that the system would accept teleworking and would be able to provide that sort of instant response, high bandwidth capability and security needs. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Uh, Mr. Issa, did you have any question or comment? Well, we want to thank both of you very much. We certainly appreciate your presence here this morning and we appreciate your participation. Thank you and your excuse. As we prepare to hear from our last panel, let me just begin with the introduction of our witnesses. Uh, Mr. John Wilkie is a trademark examining attorney with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. In 1981, he left the USPTO to take a staff position at Jerome Mills in Minneapolis as attorney. Mr. Wilk worked for the USPTO out of his home in Long Grove, Illinois, under the office's extended geographic telework pilot program. Test one, two, Mr. three. Mr. Steve O'Keefe is the founder and executive director of Telework Exchange, a public-private partnership focused on promoting the adoption of telework. Ms. Ann Bamesberger is Vice President of Sun Microsystems Open Work Service Group, an organization focused on creating an infrastructure that supports the increasingly global, dispersed, and mobile workforce. 
and Mr. Haywood J. Talco is Vice President of Public Sector Americas for Juniper Networks. With his team, Mr. Talco supports the network and security needs of government through his company's broad range of high-performance technology solutions. And so I want to thank you all for being here. Um, where is Mr. Wilson? There he is. <laughs> It's the custom and tradition of this committee, as well as others, that all witnesses are sworn in. So would you stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and we thank you all very much. And we'll proceed, and we'll begin with Mr. Wilkie. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Ranking Member Marchant, Honorable com Committee Members, and Distinguished Guests. My name is John Wilkie. I'm a Trademark Attorney Examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. It's my honor and privilege to testify before this committee this morning. I've been asked to testify because I'm a Trademark Office teleworker, and I'm also participating in a USPTO pilot program, which allows employees to work from geographically remote locations. In my case, I worked for the PTO from my home in Long Grove, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. I'm testifying from my home office today, and this is, this is my lovely basement here. <laughs> I first worked as a trademark examiner at the USPTO from 1979 to 1981. This was my first attorney <coughs> position, and I learned a, a great deal from those first few years at the office. I left the PTO to work as a trademark attorney in private industry for the next 23 years. I eventually became trademark counsel for Monsanto Company and then patent and trademark counsel for American Tool Companies, another Chicago company. During that time, I was elected to the board of directors of the International Trademark Association, and I served as chairman of several INTA committees, including the uh, INTA Patent and Trademark Office Committee. Following the takeover of American Tool, I considered several trademark positions in law firms and other companies, but when the uh, PTO offered me this position, I was very glad to uh, return to the office. I worked at PTO headquarters in Alexandria for over a year, really becoming requalified, and when I became eligible for the office's telework program, I requested that I be allowed to work from my home here in Chicago. Fortunately, the office was able to uh, accommodate that request as part of a new geographic expansion pilot program. And I've been working remotely from here since last January. The Office's telework program has truly been a wonderful blessing for me. It's allowed me to remain close to my family and friends and has allowed me to participate more fully in the life of, of uh, my community here. Uh, my family and I have lived in the Chicago area for nearly 20 years. Uh, my wife, Ophie and I raised our three children in Buffalo Grove. They all graduated from Stevenson High School in Lincolnshire. Our son, Sean, went to Columbia College in Chicago, and Matthew went to DePaul, and they both now live in, and work in Chicago itself. Um, Ophie works at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge. We're active members of the St. Mary Parish in Buffalo Grove. I sing in the choir. She's a Eucharistic minister. We have a lot of friends here that we've made over the, over the 20 years we've been here. And the, the telework program of the PTO has made it possible for me to work for the office and at the same time stay near our children and among our longtime friends. It has truly enhanced the quality of my life and the life of my family. I believe the telework pro program has also been of great benefit to the uh, Patent and Trademark Office itself. Thanks to this program, I was able to return and, and actually make a valuable contribution to the trademark examining operation. Uh, soon after my return, I was given the responsibility of assisting in the training of new examining attorneys, and I've served as a mentor for six young attorneys so far. Um, I've also maintained the highest production and quality levels, and it, have achieved uh, a rating of outstanding for every rating period since my return. Uh, last month, in fact, I was recognized by the American Intellectual Property Law Association uh, with an award that was uh, given to me here in Washington for outstanding performance as an examining attorney in the, in the patent office. 
The office has greatly benefited from the contributions of many employees who have joined the PTO or, or have come back to the PTO or have remained at the PTO in large part because of its excellent telework program. Although there's still a need to address the problem of the weekly office visit requirement, which is one of the barriers that, uh, that was uh, mentioned here earlier, I feel the PTO is still the best telework program in government or in private industry. It has truly enhanced the quality of my life and has benefited the agency as well by allowing it to attract and retain capable and experienced employees. I believe other agencies and other federal employees would also greatly benefit from the adoption and implementation of similar programs. I uh, thank you very much for allowing me to join you there today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Roki, and we will proceed now to Mr. O'Keefe. No, it's on. <laughs> Chairman Davis and subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Steve O'Keefe, Executive Director with the Telework Exchange. We are a public-private partnership. Every federal agency is <coughs> actively involved in the membership of our organization, and we have more than 6,000 federal uh, employees who have registered on our site to understand their telework opportunity. This is my third testimony on telework. <coughs> Your focus for the hearing is on breaking through and so I'm going to dispense with formality and cut to the chase. While telework is moving, the programs are locked in traffic jams and new action is required to move things forward. So why should America care about telework? Let's start with cost and gas consumption. The federal workforce spends $20 billion a year on commuting. Extrapolating to the US white collar workforce, America spends $572 billion a year on commuting. This is significantly more than the gross domestic product of the Republic of Ireland. As, a, as Americans, we burn $26 billion of gas by commuting each year. That's 62% of the US strategic petroleum reserve. Now to pollution. The average Fed pumps eight tons of pollution per year into the environment commuting. This translates to 14.4 million tons across the government. If all eligible <coughs> fed telework two days a year, uh, two days a week, we would eliminate one quarter of the emissions uh, from the federal workforce each year. Now to time and productivity. The average fed spends 245 hours commuting each year. In fact, more time commuting than on vacation each year. If all eligible feds telework just two days a week, the federal workforce would reclaim 73.3 million hours of their lives back each year. That's an additional week off work for each federal employee per year. Now to pandemic planning. As we approach the season, clearly this is top of mind. Only 27% of feds would show up for work in the event of a pandemic, according to a recent study. Just 21% say they are aware of their agency's pandemic plans. And out of these feds, only 27% note their agencies incorporate telework into continuity of operations plans. The question is, who will tend to America if Uncle Sam calls in sick. So where are the roadblocks? First, eligibility. OPM reports only 10% of eligible feds telework today. A CDW study shows that 79% of feds would telework if given the option. Clearly the math does not add up. This is why the telework exchange rolled out the telework eligibility gizmo to allow federal employees to quickly understand approximately their eligibility status. And as you know, the, uh, the eligibility criteria vary widely among agencies. In fact, it's good to see OPM testifying again. We would like to see more from OPM in the way of telework leadership. We offered to partner with OPM to establish a telework-friendly seal of approval for telework positions on usajobs.gov. This would allow agencies to identify new jobs as telework-friendly to make government jobs more attractive. We proposed this program to OPM almost two years ago, and we are still waiting for an answer. <coughs> At consecutive hearings, uh, members have asked OPM for its success in getting managers to buy into telework. Again, the same answer, no quantifiable, no quantifiable data. I would ask why. We ask OPM, <coughs> we ask if OPM will step up to provide much needed leadership or continue to take a back seat on telework. Other roadblocks, management resistance. Management resistance is still the elephant in the room. 
regrettably, we see in the federal government the continuing culture of management by walking around. Yeah. That said, as managers experience telework, they become more favorable to it. Managers that manage teleworkers are more favorable than managers that don't, and managers that telework themselves are still more favorable. The problem is that too few federal managers are teleworking. Poor mission alignment. Just 35% of federal managers believe their agencies support telework. If telework is a critical plank in continuity of operations, then clearly the message is getting lost in translation from the leadership to middle management. We need to redouble our efforts here. Lack of resources. Agencies do not dedicate the time to telework. The majority of telework coordinators today spend less than 25% of their time on telework. So it can't be all bad news, right? That's true, GSA announced an aggressive telework challenge which we heard about this morning. PTO, DISA, and other agencies are already blazing the trail. Representative Wolf proposed a national telework week and we strongly support that. And there are many activities uh, afoot on the Hill, uh, including these hearings, the S-1000, uh, proposed legislation, and the telework amendment to the uh, Energy Act, <coughs> the Energy Bill. So telework is not complete, completely gridlocked, but traffic is clearly moving too slowly. So what can we do? Benjamin Franklin uh, said that the definition of insanity is to assume the same behavior and expect a different outcome. And what we need to do is innovate. First, we need to address eligibility. We need to offer telework as an opt-out rather than an opt-in for federal employees. And we also need to require us to justify why they're making positions ineligible. We need to address management resistance, educate managers, and encourage management-specific pilot programs so managers actually have hands-on experience teleworking. We need to test drive continuity of operations. Telework is not a break glass in case of emergency proposition. And we need upfront commitment from agencies. And we need to allocate resources. Uh, one full-time senior level telework coordinator uh, per agency. Um, and that person should participate um, on a team with the IT planning support organization. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, put forth a challenge. As I mentioned earlier, we've been working with waiting for OPM to respond to us for almost two years to set up this notion of the telework-friendly seal of approval. The Telework Exchange will independently launch a government telework-friendly job bank on our website in 2008. Agencies will be able to post telework-friendly job postings at www.teleworkexchange.com. People will then be able to go to the website and check out federal jobs um, that they may be interested in applying for. The door is always open for OPM, OPM to come back to the table in terms of partnership. We'll encourage, we also encourage other agencies to take the same kinds of commitments as GSA, DISA, and PTO in the telework drive. Thank you for uh, your time to, uh, this morning, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Keefe, and we will go to Ms. Thamesberger. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Um, thank you, members of the committee, for having me here. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you some ideas from the private sector, um, having spent the last 10 years working in the area of life, life balance, work balance, and I'm very pleased to see my government taking action in, along the same lines. Um, I'd like to just briefly uh, explain the context of Sun Microsystems. It is a computer company. We've been in business since 1982. Uh, it started at Stanford University. That's indeed what SUN stands for, at Stanford University Network. Um, we were one of the first um, networking companies to embrace Unix as an open system. And we're not that large. We're about 35,000 employees, and we're at about $15 billion revenue. And I mentioned those numbers so that you have some context for some of the numbers that I'll be telling you. You can scale that up according to the population that you're probably considering in terms of um, opportunities for the government. Um, I don't think I need to dwell on the drivers that have caused us at Sun to embrace what we call open work. We don't call it telework, we don't call it telecommuting, because for us it's become the way of work. And clearly since we're a computer company, we, we are clearly very, very comfortable with technology. And yet over the last 10 years I've seen a sea change, literally in the last two years. Um, even here, I notice a lot of your staff running around with Blackberries. I'm sure they didn't do that two years ago. Um, we're looking to hire next generation employees. And um, the Gen Y people that we're studying now in, in, in research combinations with universities are, are very tech savvy. And we'll see our kids texting each other. That is a form of collaboration. It's not necessarily face to face, but it's becoming uh, a new way of engaging. And universities are embracing this, and so we're watching universities so that we ourselves can remain at the leading edge. 
um, global markets, technological innovation, you've seen them all. You know that business continuity is a big issue. Um, and what I haven't heard a lot of today, which actually surprises me, is the cost containment opportunities that this kind of work actually affords. Um, I remember the, the young lady, Miss Peterlin, who struck me as being a subject matter expert in many ways, um, did indicate that they're investing money in technology and yet still coming out ahead of the curve. The truth is you save so much on real estate by not continuing to proliferate traditional office, 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 office environments that I would submit, if you look around today, are not 100% occupied. People are in meetings, people are out, people are traveling. So even today, you probably have an opportunity to do some cost containment. Um, our response in that way is that um, over 10 years, we have now contained over half a billion dollars from our real estate run rate, which is the second highest run rate um, after salary. I would imagine that's true for you as well. And um, the truth is we can also save in technology. We've adopted what's called a thin client approach to computing, which will become more and more the norm as we look to the future. It's really what Web 2.0 is, is starting to be all about, the, the kids doing IM, the kids going on Facebook, the communication that's happening very, very fluidly on top of the computer networks. So networks are not going to be quite the same as they once were, and the fluidity of communication will really, we'll see more and more of an increase. But what I really want to do is focus not just on how we've benefited, but really spend a little bit of time on what I've heard from you to be your primary barriers, and I would welcome questions. Management resistance is indeed a barrier. I would be foolish not to say that I don't have some scar tissue. Um, the truth is the line of sight is, is a very strong perception of control. And psychologically, a belief system is, is a very, very powerful thing to try to break. Um, we at Sun have not tried to break that belief system. We've rather tried to work with it, validate managers' concerns, and in fact enlist them in providing the solution that would work both for them and for their employees. Uh, it is doable. It's not as insurmountable as it seems when you first start, nor does it have to take 10 years. Um, again, I'm seeing a leapfrog, I'm seeing a sea change, so that in the next year or two, I, I submit that managers will become more and more aware of how their employees are working this way, and the expectations of managers will be that they will manage in that way a lot more than we've seen in the past. I'm seeing that at Sun. I um, also share that from a management perspective, the, um, the, um, the, the, de the default of having this be the way of work would be a, a terrific shift in the mindset of managers so that they, rather than trying to choose who's eligible, would have to work with their staff on who isn't and why. Um, it is quite true that across all types of work, and we have marketing people, we have legal people, we have engineering people, the differences among job classes is really minuscule. And you'll find that the type of um, embracing of this work is just a matter of experimentation, trust, and time. Um, so I also want to, I see my time is, is up, I also want to really touch on two other things that um, what I didn't see here today was a, a, a systemic approach. I saw the real estate folks potentially talking about the telework centers, which is terrific. I saw the human resources people talking about management. But what would really help is if you thought of this as a system, because the total cost of operations, the real estate savings could be reinvested in the management side, and that's non-trivial. Inside a corporation like mine, our functions are siloed. So trying to get the savings from one entity and reinvest in another is a challenge, but it is doable. And it is very valuable to the employee. The, the employees really, really appreciate this. So um, I strongly encourage you to embark. Um, don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to do it all. Don't try to get it right. Um, leverage Ms. Peterlin. She was terrific. And um, I would start small. Again, I would set very clear outcomes for your pilots. Keep them small. Set the metrics with regard to your business objectives, not necessarily your telecommuting objectives, but what's the business trying to accomplish. And what you'll find is you'll probably be able to accomplish those better, faster, and cheaper by using a different way of, in, of bringing people to work and having the work come to them. So um, I thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll go to Mr. Falco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman and members of the committee, it is a great privilege to testify before you today in the pressing need for policies that help promote and enable telework and remote access across the federal government. Telework will radically alter in a very real way all facets of federal government from how it conducts business and protects and serves citizens to how it promotes good stewardship of the environment. In four short years, the front edge of the boomer generation will turn 65. 
this shift will have a significant impact on both the public and private sector. Through telework, we can help reduce and improve workers' accountability. The benefits of telework are clear. First, telework promotes efficiency. It benefits the federal government by boosting worker productivity through instant, highly secure, remote access to government networks and resources that workers need to do their jobs. Second, telework is an attrition remedy. The ability to telework acts as an incentive that makes working past retirement age both feasible and attractive for government employees who are needed to train and mentor the next generation of agency staff who will replace them. Third, telework is both a motivational and recruitment tool, as we've heard today. It can empower employees to balance work and family life, which can result in lower rates of absenteeism and better retention. Beyond the human capital benefits of telework, it is vitally important to highlight the important role telework plays in homeland security and government continuity of operations. The past several years, marked by man-made and natural calamities such as the terrorist attacks of 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the Minnesota bridge collapse, and the Southern California wildfire, wildfires had demonstrated, like few other periods in recent history, the importance of continuity of operations and emergency preparedness. It is at times like these that citizens rely on government the most and expect government to deliver needed services and support in a timely fashion. For government to respond in a timely manner, it must equip essential employees with the tools necessary to communicate and execute their responsibilities 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The good news is that off-the-shelf technology already exists to support and secure teleworking by employees. Secure socket layer virtual private networks, also known as SSL VPNs, can provide connectivity to IT assets so that employees can securely access agency resources from virtually any location using a variety of devices. More to the point, because disruptions or disasters may strike at any moment, the best way to ensure that federal workers are prepared for continuity of government is to promote and practice telework as a part of everyday agency operations. But perhaps um, of all the advantages of telework, it is the environmental benefits that most impact citizens in their everyday lives. Most, if not all of us here in this chamber, have suffered through the maddening experience of inching along or idling, as the case may be, in the Washington, D.C. area traffic. Just consider for a moment how much cleaner the air would be if federal agencies in this region alone promoted regular telework. Among their employees, now consider the man hours saved in the aggravation spirit if telework were more widely practiced. Of course, telework is not a magic bullet for all that ails the environment. It does, though, represent a way for us to cut commute times, lessen congestion, and decrease the country's dependence on non-renewable and foreign sources of energy. Yet despite all these benefits of telework I have outlined today, some federal agencies have been slow to adopt and enable to practice. To get a better sense of the government's plans for and current telework capabilities, Juniper Networks commissioned a third party to poll more than 1,400 government employees. The survey revealed most notably that 8 in 10 respondents, 79 percent, said their agency allows telework in some form. Less than 3 in 10, 28 percent, actually do telework on a routine basis. Routine basis is defined as more than 20 percent of their time or at least one day a week. Additionally, although a few government respondents, 12 percent, reported that their agencies have telework training programs, the good news is that a majority, 51 percent, said their agencies have dedicated staff to support telework, a critical coop component. In conclusion, we at Juniper Networks recognize that implementing and promoting telework policies throughout the federal government is a daunting, though not futile, task. The good news is that some agencies, such as the U.S. Department of Labor, Mine Safety and Health Administration and the General Services Administration, are already leading the way with infrastructure in place to enable telework or, or have ambitious plans to have half of eligible employees teleworking at least one day a week by 2010. Private industry looks forward to helping these and other federal agencies in every way possible as it moves towards the goal of enabling telework for all critical employees. On behalf of Juniper Networks, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kalkov, let me just begin with you. In your testimony, you mentioned that your company commissioned a survey of more than 1,400 employees on telework in the federal government. Um, how many agencies did this survey cover? I believe it covered virtually, or actually it covered all federal agencies and the majority of, st of, of state and local governments as well. Uh, did the survey ask why so few employees actually uh, 
telework when given the opportunity? I, it came down to a lot of the comments that were made by um, my colleagues that were testifying today. Um, there's concerns um, uh, from a management perspective. How do you uh, run an operation if your employees aren't centrally located? Uh, there's concerns about technology and infrastructure. There's concerns about security. Um, all those issues came up. I can speak from my personal experience at my company, um, which um, has about 6,000 employees. Um, and uh, although it's challenging, we've overcome those obstacles and uh, work remotely on a regular basis. And, and so in order to promote or further promote, um, what do you think we, we can do? I'm going to talk from just my personal perspective in running my organization, and I think it starts at the top. Um, in my group, it's not about being in the office eight hours a day. It's about getting your job accomplished in a timely fashion and meeting the metrics that we've established. Um, it's also about trusting your employees to do the right thing, uh, that when they're not in your direct visibility. I, I have an organization that's worldwide, from you know, Washington, D.C. to California to Germany, and I can't see everyone every day, and I trust that they're going to do the right thing. And then uh, the third thing is the economies of, um, of real estate. Uh, it being in the private sector, it's incredibly expensive to open facilities, and uh, the cost of, of technology and telecommuting is significantly less. Um, Ms. Bainsberg, let me ask you, what role has telework played in helping your company, uh, Sun Microsystems, recruit and retain the workforce it needs? Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I think Ms. Peterlin answered that question for me. Um, we have, over time, learned that our intellectual capital is very difficult to recruit and retain. We're in Silicon Valley. We have um, the, the famous Google stealing from, from all, of, all of the companies that used to be the Silicon Valley you know, babies. And um, in order to be competitive, we've had to increase our reach to beyond just down the street. So we find our, our knowledge workers from wherever we can. And um, in order to do that, our managers themselves have seen a value proposition that they, because they're managed to their results and their output, they have found that they need to be more flexible with regard to where they hire people. So it isn't unusual at all to find hiring managers looking for people outside of the geographic area that would make sense to commute to a location. So um, we found that it's really helped recruiting and retention because we let the work go to the individual and not have the individual drive to work. And we're finding that the next generation employee is making lifestyle decisions before they make their employer decisions. So if that's the case, then they'll be choosing where to live before they choose for whom to live, in which case we'd like to be prepared so that we can capitalize on that. Um, thank you, Mr. Keith. What, what level of satisfaction has your company found as you have interacted with individuals in both the public and private sectors relative to satisfaction among employees who actually do telework? We recently completed a study uh, with the Defense Information Systems Agency looking at its Generation Y recruits, uh, the average age about 26, so people coming into uh, the Defense Information Systems Agency. Um, so what we see there is not necessarily their level of satisfaction uh, <coughs> historically, but the priority they place on telework, and it is one of the three most important factors, the ability to work uh, where they want to, um, the flexibility not to sit in traffic in their uh, in decision to come work for the federal government. So consistently, though, we do see that uh, telework comes up time and time again. The uh, work-life flexibility as a consistent factor um, in promoting job satisfaction and promoting retention and recruitment. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Issa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on a couple of areas of questions that I think are in some, the first couple are going to be sort of government related. Uh, Mr. Wilkie? Yes? Uh, you're living in Chicago area. Uh, you work for an entity that is uh, Washington-based. Uh, we pay a premium for at the PTO for, uh, for people to work uh, here in Washington. How does that work for you? Uh, 
in that you've chosen to live in an area that has a certain cost versus the District of Columbia area? Well, my duty station is still Washington, D.C. Do, uh, do you think that's fair to the federal government that, uh, that you get paid a premium for Washington, D.C., while you can live anywhere in the world at any cost? Uh, or do you think the federal government, if they allow telecommuting, should in fact not pay a premium for where you either choose to live as a high area or choose to live as a low area, that there should be one national rate if we allow telecommuting? Well, I don't know about whether there should be one national rate, but I think uh, it would be fair to let everybody um, be uh, compensated in accordance with uh, the the uh, cost of their of their uh, location. Why? It, why? Why should the federal government subsidize somebody's choice of where they're going to live? Uh, if we're going to have telecommuting, if we're going to pay for the uh, the cost of wherever you choose to be, and this is a private sector question to the public, but shouldn't we essentially say we're not going to pay a premium for where you choose to live? I mean, you could be doing this in Maui. Uh, would we pay a little higher because you chose to be in Maui than if you chose to be in Arkansas? Would you think that's fair? Uh, I happen to think you have a lovely basement, but <laughs> uh, should I pay a difference based on where your basement is? Um, well, it, in this case, um, if I was actually my duty station was Chicago, you would be pay paying a premium because Chicago is slightly a, a higher cost area than Washington, D.C. I'm fine with, with leaving it a standard rate like, uh, like you're suggesting, saying everything's Washington. That, uh, it doesn't matter if you want to live in a, in a, in a low-rent district or a high-rent district. Uh, you should all be paid the same. Uh, and you. that's the way uh, it is right now. Uh, I guess uh, I'll go to my uh, comparatively private sector panel. He was very fair considering it's, it's his paycheck. That's very hard to do in government. But how would you see that uh, as national policy for the, for the federal government? How should we work with the differentials we pay when, in fact, that differential may not exist if someone is allowed to not come in at all? I mean, you know, we're talking about people who are full-time commuters. Uh, we'll go down, Mr. O'Keefe. And, and I'll accept how people do things in their own company if that's the best reference. <coughs> I think PTO talked about this notion of moving to a nationwide workforce, and that is, is, is coming, and this is one of the issues that has to be addressed as we move to that. But I think looking at the pay differential, clearly it has to be addressed today, but there are other factors that need to be considered as well. So, for example, if we're looking at, you know, in many circumstances, the agencies don't allow this type of distributed work. And so it, it, as those, agency, those agencies need to, you know, we talk about, uh, uh, <coughs> we talk about uh, continuity of operations, we talk about the challenges of, of recruiting and what you will, and so I think this needs to be uh, factored. This is one factor that needs to be considered as we look at a broader uh, remaking of the definition of, uh, of duty station and yes. the work environment. Ms. Ms. Bamford? Oh, Bamford. Mr. Russell, what we do at Sun is we have differentials based on geography. And I also happen to do site searching for the company when we plan expansions or retrenchments. And part of the, the, the exciting move to the countries that are lower cost had a, a huge wave of interest on the part of the company in order to save money. Um, what we found is that hiring people in India has not necessarily proven to be so beneficial in the long run, although the whole total cost of being somewhere physically and then paying salaries is taken as a as a composite. So when someone chooses to go from a high salary location and move to a lower salary, then they actually do get the lower salary. Whatever the salary is in the geographic area, they move to. If it goes in the other direction, that's up to the manager and the employee. Okay. Mr. Talco. Sure. How I do you do it at Juniper? From our perspective, I think there's, there's, there's two issues. First of all, regardless of where the employee is located, we need to make sure that they can actually perform their job. So if we have an employee that's located in Washington, D.C., that may be selling into the federal government and they decide that they wanted to move to a place where that wouldn't be possible, obviously that wouldn't be uh, something that we could accommodate. The second, and just like Sun, uh, we do have geographical, um, just, uh, ge geographical pay differences. So the higher cost areas, folks do get paid more than in the lower cost areas. And in my team, I've had people move in and out, and we change their salaries accordingly. Yep. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, my question was actually because this feeds into what the hear the, another hearing we had, which was 
where we found that people would accept a duty station for example with the border patrol or some other group that was more expensive and then t d y to a lower expense or in my case in southern california if you get a duty station in san diego you get paid more than in let's say los angeles well in fact you're you and your neighbor with the border patrol might both live in temecula and we deal with the fact that we we get that complaint all the time in my office that these differentials get gamed uh... so hopefully as we go through this and write legislation that we write it so that we in the government can keep from having it gamed and i appreciate the indulgence on that question thank, thank you, you very much and uh... Mr. Sarbane. thank you mr chairman um, i'm intrigued by the theme i hear i hear from i think all of you that teleworking is not an ends, it's, it's a means to, to some other new non-traditional workplace. And um, I, I wonder, you know, when, when we consider the legislation, one of the things we're going to be doing is asking agencies to um, articulate a policy and implement it and try to facilitate uh, telework. Uh, but I guess we could include the notion that as they do that, they should, they should take uh, pains to identify what goals of their agency are going to be fulfilled or advanced by teleworking to make them more conscious of mm -hmm. its benefits. In other words, not to simply assume th the goodness of teleworking, although intuitively we, we're all attracted to that, but to really think through how this is going to benefit the agency and get it to a new place, and telecommuting is simply a means for doing that. So maybe you could just comment on that approach. If, if I may start on that one, since that's really my, my theme du jour, um, I've worked in this domain now for a long time, and I really have seen a huge change in terms of resistance, and that the resistance is rapidly going away as the benefits that are direct outcome results of what you're being managed to do actually improve. And I mean, I, I have a lot of data on that. I don't know if I have time to get into it. But what we do is we don't measure the participation. We actually measure the business outcomes. And then we'll do surveys. We have data for, data for the last eight years on all of our pilots. And the pre and the post data is quite astonishing with regard to managing to your objectives and your business outcomes. So managing by walking around is not, need, is not necessarily an attributor to that. Managing to result and having employees feel good about the fact that the managers trust that they're getting their work done adds a tremendous amount of, of, of loyalty and self-respect to the equation, which has incredibly positive impact on the outcomes. Mr. Tack, of the whole continuity of operation, aspiration, uh, and goal is uh, one that by itself could drive a lot of the, the telecommuting uh, progress. Mm -hmm. I absolutely, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, having been a former public servant, I was a city manager when I, after I graduated college, one of the things that struck me when I was in that position was for the most part, citizens didn't need my services until there was a situation, a snowstorm. They, they, they couldn't get to work. They couldn't get to the hospital. Um, government needs, or citizens need government most when there's a crisis. And it's incredibly important, particularly in this era, that we have the ability to communicate. And right now, when you look at some of the statistics from the different surveys that were mentioned today, that's not available. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, that's scary. Um, it's more important now than it ever was before, particularly in the world that we live in, that we have the opportunity to communicate and serve citizens during times of natural disasters or man-made disasters. Mr. O'Keefe, you, you, you expressed impatience and frustration with how quickly or slowly the federal government is moving to where it ought to be with telecommuting. What industry is where it should be? at this point? Um, what workplace is, is the absolute model, or um, does the whole society need to, <laughs> to get moving faster in that direction? I'm not sure there are any perfect models, candidly. I think that the information technology marketplace where uh, 
companies trade on their intellectual property um, provide a interesting example. Clearly, it's, there's not a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison map between what the federal government does mm. and what technology companies do. I think that some of the roles that have been designated or functions that historically have been considered off the table in terms of telework um, are being challenged. Uh, JetBlue, for example, the uh, airline carrier, um, has inbound call centers which are distributed. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> the notion of, you know, if you work in a call center and you're accepting calls, you have to come to work. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can do both inbound and outbound work uh, in a distributed fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilk? Yes, Mr. Cummings? You're on. <laughs> <laughs> thought you, forgot, you thought we forgot you, huh? Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Um, to set up this uh, process, I mean, what, what do you go through the, I mean, what, what's entailed in this and who, who sets it up? In other words, the, the, uh, to create this uh, ability for you to, I guess, communicate with your fellow employees. Well, the office provides me with a laptop computer, um, two screens that I work from, two plasma screens. Uh, we have a VPN, uh, a, 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 we work through a land-based cable, Comcast, that uh, has a, uh, a line into the office every every day I go through a secure um, changing number to, to uh, log in into the servers at Alexandria Virginia all the information is there um, and uh, really it, it, this is like being at my desk at home uh, working from here mm -hmm. so then you uh you know, you see all these, uh, you see these airplane commercials uh, that says that you can be right there because it, the price is so cheap. Uh, I mean, do you see any disadvantage in not having the face-to-face -face interaction and the, well, I guess you do have face-to-face, -face, but I mean that, you know, being in the presence of another person, of other people. Well, there are some disadvantages to it because a lot of times you want to discuss various cases and what decisions should be made with the, with your coworkers and with uh, um, your manager and, and senior attorneys. Um, in most cases, it's easy enough to just pick up the phone and talk to them or, or send them an email. Um, it's not it's not as good, but it's it's um, just about as good. Um, I was, uh, as I was mentioning, as a mentor for, for young attorneys, and that's all done by email and, and by phone, and it seems to work very well. The times you really need to come to the office are for training, maybe uh, trading in the, your, your equipment to, or upgrading or whatever. Maybe you have to do an argument before the uh, trademark trial on the appeal board. Maybe you have to um, uh, meet, with, uh, meet with your law office uh, in a... In a group meeting to everybody touch base once in a while. So it's really important to get back to the office. Uh, th what's not important is just to come in as a pro forma, uh, uh, sort of tag the base kind of requirement, uh, where you come in, stop in for, for uh, the uh, 15 minutes or half an hour and then leave, because that uh, that requires you to take a plane trip that, that uses uh, uh, you know, fossil fuels, mm -hmm. it's expensive, and it's a, essentially it's a waste of time because you're not being productive on those days when you're, when you're coming into the office without a real reason to be coming into the office. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I take it that you, uh, while other people may clock in, I guess you just kind of walk downstairs and sit in front of your computer and mm -hmm. turn it on, and you're instantly at work, huh? Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, the, the office can keep track of how long I've been on my computer every day if they, if they want, uh, but mostly it's, uh, our work is tracked by how much you do. You, mm -hmm. have, you have requirements, and if you don't get down here and, and work, you, you're not going to, every, every two weeks your manager looks at that and says, uh, what you been doing? Um, 
So nobody really looks over <laughs> my shoulder all day. What is the? Uh, I mean, if you were if you were trying, I mean, you how long have you been doing this? This telecommuting? Uh, just for about a year now. Okay. I mean, if you were trying to set some policies, you know, as a, as one who has managed people, I, I think one of the things that people fear, management type fear, is that they'll lose um, supervisory uh, contact with the employee. You know, the employee go off and, you know, have a three-hour lunch or something like that or uh, goof off. Um, and I think people have, because it has been our tradition to, to operate with folks in the office and to know that they're there, I think it's kind of hard for some people to accept the fact that this can work and work very effectively. Um, but what would you, I mean, having had the experience that you've had, um, and if you were, say, uh, one putting together a program like this, what things would you be most concerned about uh, and what kind of things would you caution, say, the Congress uh, to be careful about? You, you may not have anything. I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, I think that any, uh, any agency that has a mission that can be quantified, where the employees have a, have a set um, amount of, of uh, work to accomplish, uh, have an easy time converting to this sort of system, and that's exactly what the Patent and Trademark Office has. Everything we do is, is quantifiable and measurable and it's uh, it's been established over over a number of years how much really can be done in a reasonable uh, in a reasonable time um, so if getting rid of, of uh, really the soft requirements might be one of the first things an agency would have to do uh, get, get down to things that really can be objectively measured as far as, as uh, what work work at home or telework employees would be be required, uh, but I think that that there should be uh, some requirement that that employees come back and um, meet with with uh, their their team members and their their other the coworkers and their management to make sure everybody's on the same page and moving forward. Um, in our and that is what we're required to do too. Um, so just just actually scattering people across the country and saying, okay, uh, we'll we'll see you next year. That's probably not the best uh, the best <laughs> policy. And and so and just one last question, Mr. Chairman. And so um, I guess when you you I just find it so fascinating. That I'm sitting here. Where, where are you? I'm in uh, Long Grove, Illinois, just uh, north of Chicago. It's fascinating that we're sitting here and having this hearing with you on the screen. Um, and I. <laughs> I guess we, we saved some money today, huh? <laughs> well, I saved some money because I didn't have to have to get on uh, United or, or Southwest and come into town. All right. Um, but 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 it's, your your testimony has been very helpful, and obviously it's working for you. Uh, I take it that you know you, it sounds like you, your employers don't have any complaints with what you're doing. I think you said you won all these awards and everything, so. Uh, that says a lot. Well, it's it's uh, actually imp actually improved my performance to be able to be here, um, where I can a also have access to uh, to my family when they need me. I'm not worried about uh, uh, you know, taking a day's leave every time I have to uh, meet with a contractor or have a doctor's appointment. I can work around it from here. The but the geographic extension is, is uh, the real icing on the cake, and that's the kind of thing that our agency is really in need of, for, for uh, especially on the patent side, to allow people to work really where uh, they can, uh, you know, best uh, uh, work and stay there. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Cummins. You know, it sounds like the environment probably has a great deal to do with his productivity. I mean, he is in Illinois. You know. It's a city of big, <laughs> city of big shoulders. Well, let me let me just ask you one question, Mr. Wilkie. It's it's pretty obvious from your responses and and your productivity that. This opportunity has in many ways enhanced your own quality of life 
increase perhaps your own productivity and worked extremely well for you and your family. So it's done a great deal, I think, in that sense. What does it do for the agency? Well, for the agency, it's, uh, it gives the agency the ability to, to keep people that uh, it takes years to really train a trademark examining attorney or a patent attorney, a patent examiner. And uh, frankly, the uh, you know, private industry pays more than, than the patent office does. So it's such a benefit to a worker to be able to, uh, uh, to work from home that uh, the retention rate is it's increased uh, dramatically. I think uh, Ms. Petterline can speak to that since uh, telework was, was uh, rolled out and, and the, the more it's implemented, the, the more effective that is. Would you say it's also cost effective in terms of, I think one of our witnesses mentioned containment, cost containment earlier. Do, do you think that when you add it all up, and get the bottom line, that it's been more cost effective for the agency to have you work the way that you work than to have you come into an office every day and do what it is that you do? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The trademark examining operation, uh, we have over 500 uh, people, almost 400 uh, attorneys, we, yet we only occupy three floors on that, uh, out of those six buildings over in Alexandria. Uh, everybody, if we were in the office, we'd still have the same computer equipment that we're set up with at home, so there's no difference there. Uh, but there are about five or six hundred, I'm sorry, the two or three hundred offices that are not used mm -hmm. or not needed in the Alexandria campus because of the telework program. That on the, I'm just speaking for the trademark side, and it's, it's even larger, of course, for the patent side. Well, let me thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, your being with us. And I want to thank all of our witnesses. Um, I think we've had a very productive morning. I want to thank our staff for the tremendous outreach that they've had and the recruitment that they've gone through to make sure that we had witnesses who could give us great insight into this issue. And we appreciate it very much. And with that, uh, I think this uh, hearing is adjourned.